You ready? Yep. The triangle. <laughs> Let's do this thing. <laughs> All right. Welcome back to another episode of the Evolving Man podcast. I'm here with a man named Isaac Hotek. And just to give some quick background on how you came into uh, my sphere, Isaac, is at some point we connected on Instagram. You had been creating this, uh, you know, sort of tarot style deck of cards that uh, described and involved uh, the masculine archetypes, including the shadow, the mature version, these sort of sub archetypes. And at the time, this was something that was really interesting to me. It was something I was really diving into. I was looking into King Warrior, Magician Lover. And I was like, oh man, this guy really knows his stuff. He's an artist. He's clearly passionate about this. And I ordered, an, you sent me an early copy of one of these decks. Mm -hmm. And uh, since then, that has become a, a bigger part of my life. It's, been a, it's become a part of my teachings. And so I've invited you here to have a conversation about the masculine archetypes and to hear your perspective on things. So thank you for taking the time to have this conversation with me. Thank you for being here. Yeah, grateful to be here as well. I mean, I've seen how you hold space for different men and around these conversations. I just have lots of respect for the work that you do. So glad to join in here. Awesome, man. Okay. So just to set the stage for this, for this conversation, um, perhaps what we could do is start with an intro, considering that somebody uh, doesn't even know what the masculine archetypes are. And then my assumption is that actually a lot of people who are listening to this have at least opened the door to this. And so I'd like to dive into detail in, in some of the archetypes or, or all of them, talk about your perspective on things and get down to some really practical ways that guys can actually do the work of moving towards uh, the mature version of, of each archetype and perhaps even at the end, integrating all of those uh, together yeah. into his life. So um, what are the masculine archetypes. Yeah. So to take one step back from that, just what are archetypes in general? And then we'll look at these masculine ones. So uh, archetypes are Carl Jung, who kind of founded this concept, are he believed that archetypes are universal symbols. They're things that we have in the collective unconscious. It's an understanding, a, a, a pattern of behavior that all of us get instantly because it's it's beyond our DNA. It's kind of in our ancestry. It's in the very codes of, of humanity. And he did this by looking at different myths and cultures and, and dreams. A lot of it came through all these symbols that repeated over and over in his clients' dreams. So a great example is the warrior. When I say, you know, what is a healthy warrior? People already have an idea. It pops in their head. They see someone who is determined, who has a strong will, who fights for what they believe in, right? I don't even have to say that. It's just imagery that pops in. So yep. those are archetypes. And how we can use them is we can, I like to think of them as uh, focal lenses that can focus on different aspects of our life. So if we were to say like, who are you? It's just this big gray wash of lots of different details. But if I say, how's your warrior? It gives it more focus. So you can say, oh, how is my warrior? How do I allow myself to build my will to be determined to fight for what I believe in, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's how we can use archetypes. Yeah. And in this system, there the one that I use, there are five different masculine archetypes. Uh -huh. got cool. I'm excited to hear about the five, especially yes. because uh, my original learning was was uh, four. So yeah, if you want to give a quick overview of them, I'd love that. Yeah, yeah. So mine's just a little different than King, Warrior, Magician, Lover, and I'll just put a little spice in there. Um, we have the Warrior. Then next we have, and that's around dedication, uh, strength, moving forward action. Mm -hmm. Then we have the Wizard, which is about intelligence, wisdom, knowledge, lover, which is about sensuality, presence, emotional vulnerability, father, which is around responsibility, caregiving. And lastly, sovereign, which is like king, uh, is around strategy, harmony of one's realm, 
efficiency, right? Like just getting things done, that mm. sort of thing. And almost, and I mean, a connection to the divine, mm. right? A connection mm-hmm. to uh, the the yeah, whatever the divine order of the universe. Let's say, yeah, great. Um, yeah. So why look into this stuff? You know, um, I, I'm going to paraphrase uh, Carl Jung in saying that you know, the, the, the biggest thing we could do in our lives is understand the nature of our own consciousness. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the largest mission a man could ever undertake is really understanding what makes him tick at a deep level. And that means looking under the covers, (laughs) you know, looking under the surface of the water, right? Uh, seeing that, (laughs) other piece of the iceberg Mm -hmm. that's that's floating right and we tend to struggle to understand uh concepts without uh structure right like we are structural beings like we live in a world of polarity light and dark and hot and cold and masculine feminine and you know um you know, self and other, and like, there's all this duality We're we're in the world of duality. And, and, um, that's just how we understand the world. And so if we can break things up into pieces and look at them individually, it seems to help, you know, there's, there's a ton of therapeutic techniques, uh, that do this where, you know, a person comes to a therapist with a problem and they help the person sort of break down that thing into different pieces and different characters. You know, there's a narrative therapy where you just sort of like build a story and then, and then you build a new story and you, you know, who's the characters. And that's a very helpful and useful form of therapy for people because it, um, it externalizes things and allows them to sort of see them from the outside. Mm. And so that's kind of what we're doing with, with archetype work, right? We're, we're taking, you know, me as a whole being and, and my entire psyche and we're, we're sort of taking it out for a moment outside of us and we're splitting it into multiple different pieces, different characters that are all sort of living in there and, and, um, and sometimes competing for space at the same time, collaborating or competing with each other. And, and we're looking at those different characters and seeing how they're behaving inside of us. And, and for all of us, we all have um, unique expressions of those things. But uh, I digress. The reason for that is so that we can really understand ourselves at a deeper level. And if you can understand, let's say, uh, your warrior and, and, uh, what's up with your warrior, maybe what the shadow side of it is or where, where your warrior maybe is weak, then you can actually do something about it. You can't do something about something that you don't understand and that you can't see. So the, the whole purpose is just to shine a light and to see what we need to see. Yeah. Around. With that, around 10 years ago, I started this work and I read the, I read the book, King, Warrior, Magician, Lover, and it's an amazing book, but I came out of it and I was like, how, how do I put this in my daily life? It was a lot of information, but where do I go from here? So the yeah. first thing I did is on my altar, I put five little buckets basically, and I would put a coin on each one of them. Well, it was four at this point, depending on if I connected to that archetype. So I'd say, okay, I'm going to put one coin on the warrior because I really stood up for myself at work this week. I'm going to put two on my lover because I went, um, had time with myself, my lover and friends. And that way, every week I would take stock and say, where's my energy going? Wow, I have way too much energy in my wizard, not enough energy in my lover and in my warrior. So then I could start building those and creating conscious structures and and um, hobbies that would then add and enrich my life and, and give me more balance. So that's how I started this work is around what you're saying. It's once we see the holes, once we see where the weaknesses are, we can start filling them in um, and we can start playing with it. It's This isn't like a, like a, oh no, I'm being suppressed by all these terrible things that I have to do and I'm no good if I'm if I don't have a warrior, that's not what we're saying. We're saying, right. just look at it. And yeah. if you want to add more warrior in your life, do it, you know, yeah. find ways of doing it and you'll improve, uh, and move towards where you want to be. Yeah. And there's, um, there's like a simplicity to this for me as well. It's like, um, 
when you're trying to improve your life and you're, 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 you're trying to figure out like what's wrong, you know, like my energy's kind of low. I'm kind of not happy at work. And like, there's a, this sort of energy that's not good and I'm not sleeping well and I don't know what to do. When you take a lens of, of like an archetypical lens, let's say, or four archetypes or a five archetypes lens on things and you look at, okay, when you do an assessment, like, okay, well, where's my warrior at? Let me check in with my warrior. Am I giving my warrior lots of energy? Is it sort of shadow expressed or what's going on here? How's my lover? And you check in with each of those. It gives you a system to uh, really kind of understand where, where to put your energy, right? So yeah, it mm -hmm. might become clear to you that like, oh, you've been all warrior, but you've been completely denying your lover. Like you've bled all of the excitement and, and joy and sensuality out of your life. And no wonder you're, you're depressed. You've been working 60 hour weeks or whatever it may be, right? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's a beautiful system. So maybe what we could do is like spend... 10 minutes or so on each archetype and talk about, um, you know, how you see it. I'll share a little bit about how I see it. Mm -hmm. uh, and we'll talk about the shadow expressions and then how a person can strengthen that particular archetype. And before we get into it, maybe we'll talk about the shadow side. So yeah, the idea here is that, um, you know, there's polarity within each of these. <laughs> there's polarity in the warrior. Like there's, there's a, there's a, like a higher expression of the warrior, like a mature, there's an immature. And then there's also kind of like a dark side that, that is expressed uh, in the warrior. And it can be expressed in multiple ways. The way that, um, that Robert Moore and Douglas Gillette frame it in the book, King, Warrior, Magician, Lover, is that there's sort of like two poles on each one. And I think maybe that's an overly simplistic view, but it, it's sometimes nice to have a simplistic view that like there's, there's either an overexpression or an underexpression. So for instance, with the warrior, the warrior being like fire and, and, um, you know, forward movement, and you sort of see a warrior with a, a sword, the, uh, the shadow, the two shadow expressions of that is, uh, one where the sword is like, the guy's like running around, just chopping stuff. He's, he's, uh, he's a sadist. He just wants to chop people. Like, give me some to chop. Give me somebody to chop. I'm going to chop them. You know? Uh, and I'll, I think a lot of guys can relate to having a lot of that energy when they're 18, 19, 20, 21 years old, you know? Um, you know, just, just got that punchy energy, like give me something to punch. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, the sadist and that, you know, the party that really, really wants people to hurt. I think all of us have, uh, a, a little bit of that in us. The other side of that shadow could be the underexpression or uh, sort of the a way that that's turned in on yourself. And so it's like you're stabbing yourself or you're cutting yourself. Like literally, like there's lots of people out there who have some history of self physical self-harming. There's lots of other ways to self-harm uh, or you're sort of self-sabotaging in your life or you're, you're like just kicking the crap out of yourself in your own mind, right? So, so it's, there's like the sadist, I'm going to hurt other people. And there's the masochist, I'm going to hurt myself. And the conscious warrior has his sword sheathed at his side. He's strong and he's a trained warrior. He's, he knows how to kill. He knows how to defend, but he's not running around, like looking to take action all the time in that way. Uh, he's balanced, right? So that's kind of the idea between like the shadow poles being these sort of two things on almost like a, a different level from the, the highest expression. So mm -hmm. I, if you've got anything to add to that, please, I'd love to hear. It. Yeah. And, and there's this idea that these shadows being these polar, um, kind of negative expressions of this archetype, it's not about getting rid of them. It's about finding balance in the middle and integrating them. So it, there are moments in which that sadist-like energy is useful when you do have to fight, right? When, when there is a calling to take action in that way. But there are other times when you're not asked to do that. So it's about bringing those two sides closer in and wielding them with consciousness is when you find the balanced middle. So if there's a triangle, you have yeah. the two sides. And then as they get closer in, they go up the triangle to the top where you have the balanced archetype. Uh huh. Yeah, I like. I really like that idea with the triangle because if you picture a straight line between two poles, positive and negative, and you've got these two negative, it's like a 
negative charge in the middle is kind of just neutral and mm -hmm. you're still on the same level as those two things. So when you bring in a triangle, there's this understanding that you're like, you're literally moving up, you're transcending mm -hmm. upward to, towards something new, but you're still not losing sight of your, the, what's down there. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and the idea is that as you move further towards the mature expression, uh, your swings to the shadow are not so big anymore, right? So in a way, it's like if you just picture an, uh, a normal progression into maturity, it's like as you get older, you know, as you move from 20 to 30 to 40, your sadist, you know, when you're 20, like you're literally running around looking for a fight on the street, which is exactly what I was doing when I was 20. I was like, you know, just throwing punches. And then when I was 30, I was like, I was still tussling with people in the workplace and like, uh, not physically, but I was like, you know, being kind of a hero and starting battles here and there. And, and now I'm a little like much more balanced uh, with that energy and I'm not so sadistic anywhere, you know? Um, so it gets your, ideally, if you're doing your work, your shadow poles are not so extreme as you, as you get older. So the idea here is each archetype has a shadow side, right? And, mm -hmm. um, you know, a man's ultimate goal is to move towards the mature side of that, integrate the shadow, and then to learn to balance all the archetypes. So, um, we'll try to, in this conversation, get as practical as possible for guys so that there's some, some real like, um, workable stuff, um, that guys can take away from this conversation. So which archetype do you want to start with? Well, since we dove into the warrior, we can kind of round it out. Cause I think we've got a yeah, pretty good handle on it so far. Um, so yeah, a few things, the warrior we've talked about how it's around action. It's around doing things. It's about belief, right? And one thing that's a little different in the system that I have with the, the masculine archetype deck is I have this thing called sub archetypes, which is basically a way of me showing how these archetypes show up in a daily way. That's a little bit easier to understand because if someone says a warrior, it's like, am I a warrior or is that more of a fantasy? Um, well, yeah. Another way you can look at it is uh, an activist. Like, are you out fighting for a cause? Mm -hmm. Are you athletic? Are you, do you push yourself physically to know yourself? Are you a hunter? And by that, I mean, taking the time to be very precise with your energy. Uh, you know, it's all about timing when you're hunting to bring something back to your community and so on. Yeah. So those are just different examples of how this energy can show up in your daily life, in your choices, as your work, in your relationships. Um, there was also a soldier, right? That was yeah. the fourth one that you had, soldier. Yeah, I really like that you do this, that you broke these down into these sub-archetypes. It's just extra pieces, and it, it just helps things be a little more relatable. Because when you, yeah, when you look at the warrior card, it's a samurai with a sword. Yeah. And you're like, is that, you know, how is that coming through me? But um you know, there's, there's many, many ways to look at, at the archetypes and, uh, a friend of mine, his favorite way to look at this is just via the elements, you know, which, mm -hmm. what's, which essential element is really coming through in this archetype and it's fire for the warrior and fire has the ability to destroy and burn off something that, that needs to go, that needs to die. Um, and, and I, I, I guess, but it, <laughs> I don't have a full explanation for it, but there's also this element of th this idea of creation in the warrior. Mm -hmm. So like the warrior cr creates what needs to be created, takes, takes action and actually builds things. Um, can, like really get shit done. can be a, a fantastic, uh, worker. Mm -hmm. And the warrior is also not afraid to like cut and, and get rid of what, uh, needs to be destroyed, you know, endings, yeah. beginnings. Yeah, strong around boundaries too, right? Like the warrior mm -hmm. upholds those boundaries. So it's if we don't have a warrior, then we are easily pushed and pulled by other people's desires, doing things we don't want to do. That's a big part of the negative aspect when we're disconnected, which is one thing that I see in culture. When, when I was creating this deck, I was asking my community around like different symbols I wanted to use and concepts. And I talked about the warrior and a lot of people got upset. They're like, we don't need a warrior. Warriors, uh -huh. 
Warriors are old. Those are old uh, generational things. It's like, no, without the warrior, we don't have those strong boundaries. We don't have the will and strength. And I see that in a lot of men and a lot of people missing the dedication and the fire that that feeds so well into the other archetypes that think about the warrior lover, right? Having that passion and fire and action in your love life, in creating that, you can see how it just adds fire to the flame, right? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. And, you know, if you were to think about an emotion that is related to fire, <laughs> it's pretty clear that anger is there. And, you know, speaking about things that have been repressed from society, anger is also one of those things. We're quite afraid of our anger. And <clears throat> in my opinion, <coughs> excuse me, in my opinion, we need to learn to reintegrate that. We need, actually need a better relationship to our anger. Because if we don't have a relationship with our anger, it actually controls us. It moves into the shadow, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I always like to think of anger. Anger wants action. It wants change. It's one of the fastest way to feel into what you want changed. So if you suppress your anger, then you don't really know what you need to do to get out of situations that aren't feeding you, right? So it's, it's useful as long as it's wielded consciously. Yeah, and anger can, the, the, the suppression of anger can cre- create depression, right? Uh, if, if, and, it, and so this is very related to the, to the warrior, you know, like if we suppress our anger and we just continue to say yes to things that we want to say no to, uh, depression creeps in because we start to lose this idea that we actually have freedom in our lives and that we're, you know, actually living a life that we want to live. We just keep saying like, yes, okay, but we really want to say no. That phenomenon is directly related to um, our relationship to our anger. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't have a healthy relationship to their anger. They reject it and it actually becomes a thing that just pops out every once in a while. (laughs) And it pops out in a bad place and then they try to hide it, (laughs) run away from it again and escape it so that it doesn't, you know, I hope I don't see that for a a while, you know. Uh Um, And so, yeah, I think you've tied this together. Uh, tied this in really well, this idea of like anger being uh, related to your boundaries, to saying yes to what you want to say yes to and saying no to what you want to say no to. And man, we need anger. Like imagine a parent whose child is in danger. There's some one or something that wants to hurt that child and a parent that doesn't have anger, doesn't have that mm-hmm. impulse to, to, to swoop in there and say, but back off right? And yeah. protect, right? There's a protector there that, that of course, when it gets out of control, it becomes the sadist. It becomes like, I'm going to gun all you down because I'm, because <laughs> I'm angry, right? I'm going to shoot everybody. Uh, but there's a, there is a balanced uh, way in the middle where you're protecting something that needs to be protected. I mean, you're protecting right, your, th- your rights, the rights of someone else, right? Defending something for a noble cause, you know? Um, there's, there's warrior energy there that is, is good and is needed. Right. So yeah. Any piece around the shadow do you want to share? Yeah. I would just say that in my system, it's a little different than the King Warrior Magician Lover. And the difference is the two that I use are the coward and the aggressor, the aggressor being overactive, the coward being underactive. The reason I use those is I think they're a little easier to understand than sadists and masochists of how they show up. Um, And the last thing I would just say is, because they're very, very similar to King War Magician Lover, but what you were just kind of getting at, right? Like suppressing the anger and then it bursts out. That kind of shows you the bipolar nature of the, the shadows where you're you're in the coward, you're not expressing what you need, you're not expressing uh, fears, or you're afraid of hurting someone else, so you just kind of hide away in the corner, and it bubbles and bubbles and bubbles, and then you jump over to the aggressor, you show that and jump back, and that's when you're disorganized with the shadow. So it's about 
bringing those closer together. Like, okay, like there's not a point in which I won't have fear or won't be a little coward or a little too aggressive, but how do I get them closer? Uh -huh. And I get them closer by being more empowered by who I am, by being more um, fully aligned with, with my identity and so on. And getting in touch with that inner fire, right? Yeah. Uh, the, I think this is something that a lot of people uh, can relate to is this idea of like not speaking up, not saying the thing, you know, continuing to sort of like take a beating quote, whether it's in a relationship or in a job or, or whatever in your environment. And then you just snap at some point and you destroy some stuff. You punch some holes in some walls or, or you get fired or you wreck a relationship. Mm -hmm. And what we're saying here is that that is exactly what you're saying. This is the bipolar nature of, of, of being out of touch with your conscious warrior. And you need to get more in alignment with your inner fire and honor that, you know, nurture that energy and honor it and, and give it space in your life, right? And learn to bring your fire into your life, which takes courage because usually you're in the coward position because you're afraid, right? There's, there's some fear there. You just, you mentioned it, right? And the warrior is courageous. He counters fear with courage. Mm -hmm. So, um, Clearly, I, I suppose one of the action steps a, a man could take to step into his warrior is to think about, you know, what in his life right now is he recoiling from? What are you afraid of that you're not addressing? Is it a conversation that you need to have? Is it some some type of action that you need to take in your life? Do you need to talk to your boss? Do you need to talk to your wife or your husband? Right? Um, do you don't, do you need to go talk to your neighbor? about this thing that your neighbor has been pissing you off about for the last two years, but you've been too afraid to go have that conversation, right? So that's, that's definitely one action piece, but, um, yeah, any other suggestions for, for men to embody the warrior to step into that archetype? Yeah. So I, one thing I've done with groups when we've talked about the warriors at the end, it's like, what, what could you do to really bring this into your life? And in multiple groups that I've ran one, has come up from a few people, which is they just say like, hey, I want to really dedicate to doing one thing over the next few weeks, like working out or meditating, whatever it is. And the warrior piece is it comes in when you really don't want to do the thing, right? Like you didn't sleep well and last night and you really don't want to work out. That is the moment you practice the warrior because you've dedicated to it and the warrior shows up in those moments when you get pushed down or something doesn't quite work and you would normally give up. So it's a great way, like some people connect just being strong and athletic to the warrior. And what you've seen is what we're talking about is much more deeper around psychology, identity, consciousness, that sort of thing. Like that's the realm of archetypes. Mm -hmm. So don't think like it's just about exercise, but you can use the exercise as a metaphor to connect to it by that dedication, getting up and doing that repeated task, even though you don't want to all the time, is a great way to practice this. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Yeah, in the men's groups that I'm a part of, um, there is an element of accountability, an element of mm -hmm. guys saying, uh, you know, a guy will have a share, he'll talk about something that's not going well in his life, we'll ask him some questions like, well, how is this connected to your father? Or how is this... What are you doing here? What are you doing there? And towards the end, a guy will say, what are you going to do about this? Mm -hmm. Or is there something you want to commit to with us that you're going to do in the next week that's going to take you towards taking the action that you just told us you want to take, right? It's going to actually move the needle here. And that's, that's the warrior, right? The warrior is the code. Make your word good, right? Say what you mean and do what you say. Follow through. Finish things, right? Mm -hmm. Finish what you started. Uh, yeah, great. Uh, it's a very action. Okay, so I think that is a pretty good uh, coverage of the warrior. And, you know, for some reason, I feel like the warrior is, is actually more well-known. Despite it yeah. being kind of like repressed in our society, it's actually easier to understand than especially 
the lover and the magician. The magician is, yeah. is or, or the wizard is, is the biggest mystery. But which one do you want to go to next? Um, let, let's go with wizard. Okay. Yeah, so uh, with the wizard, it's all around knowledge and wisdom and seeking to know the mysteries of it all, right? And this can look like two things. One of them is it can look like an approach of scientific understanding, of looking at the stars and understanding astronomy and the way that plants grows and systems and patterns. But it can also look as a spiritual seeking of where am I in the universe? How do I connect to divinity and this complexity of life? So both are true, right? And some of us connect to one side more than the other, but it's both hold the energy of that wizard, of that magician that's looking. Because what is spirituality except for an awe to how beautiful and complex the world is? Mm -hmm. And the deeper you go into science, the more you're going to find that. And the deeper you go into spirituality, the more you'll find that. Uh huh. Yeah, that's beautiful. So at at the same time, it's the engineer or the computer scientist and it's the shaman. Yeah. Right. The plant medicine guy, right. Who's like, they're both, they're both examining these unseen forces in the universe and, 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 and sort of acquiring special knowledge. Mm -hmm. Right. So this archetype very much deals with the mind. And the element is air, which kind of also makes sense because it's like up here. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, what are some of the sub archetypes of the wizard? Yeah, so the sub archetypes are, um, <laughs> I'm trying to remember them off the top of my head. Uh, so we've got, ooh, uh, there's like a, the scholar. Yeah, right? scholar. I'm going to cheat. I'm going to look. It's been a moment. <laughs> yeah. And I, I mean, these, this archetype deck is, if you want to learn about archetypes, get, uh, uh, get a set of this, these, this, these cards. Um, many, many of the guys in my life have ordered, uh, a deck of your cards and there's just something about having a physical thing these days. Like <laughs> there's less and less physical objects and more and more things are just on your browser tabs and they don't have the same uh, sort of tangible value. And so I actually, even though it's just a deck of cards, I've actually really enjoyed having those in my hand. So, I mean, why not uh, do a little commercial for your cards in the middle of the episode? So it's, <laughs> it's Hero Rise dot us yep is that where people can find it and then you're on instagram as well yeah and i've right. got like a free ebook you can check out there that goes over these archetypes gives activities you can pick a card online for free because i just want to make this accessible but like you're yeah. saying when you have something physical and and the imagery just speaks to your subconscious yeah. you really don't need to read the book if you just played with the decks long enough these concepts are steeped in the subtlety of choices of colors, of body movements, of images. Um, and that's why I did it, because I wanted to make it more uh, acceptable, uh, approachable, and easeful. Right? Yep, yep, you certainly achieved that. Okay, so the sub-archetypes of the wizard. Yeah, so we have the inventor, right? Which is also like the entrepreneur, the person who's going out and coming up with ideas and making them a reality. You have yep. the scribe or the scholar, which mm -hmm. is looking around them, looking at all the information, the history, the things that are happening and wanting to document them because that's mm -hmm. the sanctity of holding knowledge into the future, which is such a huge and important thing. Then we have the seeker, which is the, the spiritual seeker, the someone who's looking to understand the world. That could be a meditator, the shaman, and so on. Mm -hmm. um, and lastly, teacher, which uh -huh. is, Teaching is the same thing of like the scribe. It's bringing knowledge forth and helping it continue down the line and continue down the ages. It's such an important role in, in our society. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So yeah, this archetype very much deals with information, mm -hmm. knowledge. <clears throat> and the, the let's go over the shadow aspects 
of, of the wizard. So in King Warrior Magician Lover, it's uh, the manipulator. So the manipulator is, is the one who uses knowledge to control others. And um, that's not always like an overt thing, like I'm going to lie to you so that you do this thing because because I'm super evil. Uh, sometimes it's just like, it's as subtle as like, you know what? I'm not going to give all the information away because I kind of want to just keep some of it for myself, mm-hmm. right? Like I go out and I learn this stuff and then I become a teacher, but there's a part of me that that doesn't want to share all that I've learned because I don't want to give it all away because it took me some effort to get there. So I'm going to, I'm just going to hold some of that back. That's a very small shadow aspect that that's showing up in that moment, right? Or I'm just going to, I'm going to withhold from you here because I kind of like the power. There's a subtle manipulative energy there that uh, is sometimes not recognized. So that's the manipulator. And then there's it, in King Warrior, King Warrior Magician Lover, they've got the dummy. So it's kind of like, it, it's, it's the denial of your own ability to know and to take in information. And you, you, you just like absolve yourself of, of any sort of wizardry. You're like, I'm just dumb, dumb. And you either, you either, you either believe you, you know, fully believe that within you, or you just play the dummy. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, the, in the system I have, I have two, which is the know-it-all. <laughs> and that is really when you're so inflated around your own belief of your knowledge that you just won't take anyone's opinion, right? So that's an overactive version of the archetype. It's like, hey, I know everything, even though if I'm a newbie or someone else is is more in- intellectual around the subject than me, I'm just going to cast this shell this boundary and protect myself. And that's the know-it-all. Yeah. And then the other side is the charlatan, which is kind of like the manipulator, which is saying, hey, I'm going to bend these rules. I'm going to move things so they support me. And a big thing about a, a charlatan is they actually spread disinformation. They spread, they, they want people to not have knowledge because it makes them more um, susceptible to what they want right? They can bend their will a little bit more. Mm -hmm. So both those are knowledge, but how we interact with it. Do we hold on to it too tight and protect ourselves from anyone else and their opinions? Or do we subtly manipulate, hide knowledge and and take that power from others? Yeah. Beautiful. I love the use of both of those. They're I I think they're more relatable actually than Uh the manipulator and the dummy. Um, And you know, quick interlude, like, which one of these guys is right? You know, which one of these should I be focusing on? Uh, it doesn't matter. (laughs) Yeah. Right. Like, like, how are you a manipulator? How do you play the manipulator? Just ask that question of yourself, honestly, give yourself some honest answers and then move on. How are you, how do you play the dummy? Right. I'm a dummy in this way. How are you a charlatan? How do you, how do you, you know, put on that show? How do you put on a mask? Mm -hmm. Right. And how are you a know-it-all? The know-it-all is like, um, thank you for doing the know-it-all. Cause that (laughs) one is like, man, we all know a big (laughs) know-it-all. Everybody knows a big know-it-all and everybody has a know-it-all inside them somewhere. Right. Um, so all four of these are, are really useful to look at and, 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 Uh, try to see in ourselves. So if we're moving towards the mature expression of the wizard, uh, how can we do that? How can we nurture that energy in our lives? Yeah, I think maybe I'll just share an an example of shadows and how they show up and integrating them because the know-it-all is by far the strongest shadow of of me, of, of my identity. And it comes from my childhood. So when I was a kid, my, my dad in particular really teased my mom and we started to emulate that as kids where we teased each other. And then our family really teased everyone. Mm. And what it turned into is this kind of battle of wits where if I wasn't the smartest person in the room, then I was probably going to be made fun of. So I would be constantly positioning myself to be more intelligent to make fun of other people's intelligence. And I created this boundary of protection around me. And 
I wasn't aware of it. It was just how I grew up. And then this same pattern started coming into my relationships where, you know, no one wants to be with a know-it-all where they're just totally not listening to you, where they're like, the know-it-all is constantly jabbing, teasing, and so on. So it was really disruptive to my relationships, to my friendships, to my my connection to my parents, to, uh, yeah, my lovers. Mm -hmm. So once I became aware of this through archetypal thinking, looking at my shadows, it was starting to break it down. And now it feels like a mode that I get in. And it still happens all the time. I still like to prove my intelligence when I'm meeting someone new or I try to show off in that way. But now I can watch it and I can go, oh, there you are. <laughs> I know this game. I know this part of me. And I can just bring it back just a little bit. And even that salt, small, subtle movement, little changes like that, over time as you practice make big changes and oh. now i see myself doing that a lot less i'm i'm a lot less to interject into a conversation and say something that might not be true just because i want to be smart mm -hmm. I'm, I'm more likely to open and listen to others and that leads to a much better relationship to a much better life right uh-huh thank you thank you for sharing that um in, in a sense, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of meta on this because like, here you are sharing this on this show. Here you are sharing publicly what your shadow is. And like, folks, if you want to know a great way to do shadow work, stand in front of a group of people and own your shadow. Mm -hmm. Speak to that part of yourself that you kind of don't want people to see, right? Like, I know it takes some courage for you just to share this peace on this show. Mm -hmm. And, and on top of that, at the same time, as you talk about how you're changing and, and the new part of you taking over, you're also reinforcing how the shadow doesn't have control over you anymore and how you, you can sort of see it and step back from it, see it for what it is and claim that mature, uh, wizard in you mm -hmm. that has the knowledge and doesn't have to boast about it or speak about it. He can just hold it just just have it in here right and be quiet right mm -hmm. so beautiful thank you for sharing that um yeah so any other thoughts on on integrating uh the the the, the wizard i'm mindful of time here we got three archetypes to get through but yeah um how can people nurture that 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 energy of the wizard yeah i think you kind of pointed to it and i'll just kind of rephrase it a little bit of one of the things with any of these integrations of these shadows is it's just about awareness. Mm -hmm. Can I open up my awareness to my negative patterns and just see them, see when they come up? And slowly that awareness grows and grows. You start seeing the subtleties of things and you just start changing. Like mm -hmm. it's not this thing where if you do A, B, and C, you're going to turn into this whole new person. There's just an opening up, a consciousness that slowly grows like a seed that's just starting to turn into this plant, which is a healthier version of yourself in that archetype. Mm -hmm. Granted, there are still practices of figuring out, oh, I do this, what could I do instead? But that's going to be so personal and your awareness will bring that forward. So give your time to reflect, give your time to journal to yeah. stand with a group of men or a group of people and share your shadow, like you're saying, and you'll just find like, this will just move. It will just happen. It takes a while and that's okay. So be uh, compassionate with yourself, but it will change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's almost like the action of the wizard is really the practice of learning. And mm. so, you know, really practically like, you want to nurture the wizard, place yourself in a position to learn, open your mind to learning, whether mm -hmm. that's in school, in business. And what you and I really are honing in here on is the art of learning about oneself, one's own consciousness. Yeah. And doing that in the, in, in the presence of other people is, you know, and I know that it's like the most powerful way you could, but you can also sit and meditate and learn about your mind and observe your mind and, and practice that as well. But practice learning, practice observing, 
and mm-hmm. and and learning about the subtlety of of the universe of your own mind and um uh, okay beauty <laughs> shall we do the lover yeah sounds good okay want me to go yeah so the lover archetype is the part of ourself that connects to sensuality that connects to presence that connects to our emotionality, right? Like how intimate and open can we be? And what is sensuality but being so aware and fully present with our moment, right? To be present with our touch, our taste, our smell, all of that is in the now. And that's the key to unlocking the lover is the appreciating of the now, the the cultivating the beauty of the moment and to really soak in it to just open your eyes to how gorgeous everything can be that's that's the key to the lover Mm -hmm. yeah the the other three or four archetypes would be robotic and feeling dead without the lover so um and that's actually one of the shadow sides of the lover is the sort of numb cut off from feeling uh, they call it the impotent lover in, in the book, but it's not about like a flaccid penis impotence. It's, it's a cut off from feeling, mm-hmm. right? And there's many, many reasons why a person can end up that way. Trauma or, or just that never being reinforced or living in a place where, you know, there isn't much of that around. You know, if you grow up in a house that's full of music and dancing and, and laughter versus growing up in a house where there's no music, no dancing, no laughter, and it's just hard work right? That's, you're going to get very different um, raising up or or rearing of the lover within you. Uh, The element here is water. So there's, you know, there's this sort of watery uh, flow, intuition, you know, like what's coming through right now. It's very present moment. You know, water's always, even a totally calm pool of water that has no ripples whatsoever is still moving underneath. There's just this constant movement. Um, and, you know, musicians, dancers, artists, uh, you know, lovers like romance, this is all the realm of, of the lover. Mm -hmm. Right. And, uh, you probably know someone who seems, you know, embodies the lover, uh, quite well. And I, I have known a few men as well. It's like, this guy plays the flute. He plays the guitar. He's a painter. He's like, the women love him. He's got long hair. He's suave. And, and the guy, he seems to have no plan in his life, but things work out well for him. He's got some kind of wacky intuition. And, and he's like, it, I don't understand him, but there it's <laughs> like, he's, He's supported by this unseen force and he seems to be having the best time ever in his life. He's having so much fun. And, uh, <laughs> that's, that's my perspective of, of guys who are truly in the lover, like a hundred percent there. And those guys have their own issues with, uh, maybe the structures of the world. Um, but man, do they seem like they're having a lot of fun. <laughs> So yeah, that's that. Um, let's go to the shadow. So the the shadow side is like I, I mentioned the impotent lover, mm-hmm. and um, so there's this sort of really sort of numb like no, it's you know if if you have an internal story that's like it's not safe to feel, or it's not safe to express myself fully which is, believe it or not, is something that I have, <laughs> even though I seem like really fully expressed. Like I do have that um, story inside me. That's the impotent lover, right? Uh, the other side is the addicted lover. It's just like, I can't get enough. Like, just give me more, 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 more all the time. And it's like, uh, this person's life is out of control because of their pursuit of some form of sensuality whether it's sex or drugs or gambling, uh, whatever, some, it, it, it's, it's related to um, feeling good and it's just never enough, right? There's this over like the lover is out of control. He's driving the bus, right? Um, so what, please remind me, what are the, 
how do you describe the the shadow poles in your um you've got the addict right yep yeah. yeah so very similar just slightly different wording so it's the addict which is that craving hedonistic and it it's basically enjoying doing whatever you enjoy without caring how it affects others including yourself <laughs> like drinking to the point of destruction um loving people to the point like going from lover to lover but not thinking about how it how it will affect them right those are the negative aspects and then the other one the other side would be the lost dreamer mm -hmm. which is being disconnected um lost in one's th thoughts it's it's the kid at the playground who doesn't play with anyone else who just sits like reading or imagining what they could be having or the adventure they could be in as compared to being in the presence, right? So it's um, running away from the now and getting lost in, in imagination. Yeah. So, I mean, if you're listening to this and, and you can think of, of one or various things in your life that you are missing out on because you're not pulling the trigger to just sort of jump in and go feel, uh, this is your opportunity to step in to the lover, right? Um, yeah. So how do we embody the lover? we uh we step forward into feeling and uh, you know this is really important for men because in many ways we live in a in a society and we we have certain cultural um restrictions that restrict us from feeling fully and from mm -hmm. expressing ourselves fully uh you know i was born in 1984 and i can't tell you the number of things that were labeled as gay when i was a kid and so therefore uh you know not okay not not socially appropriate by my peers and luckily, a lot of that stuff is becoming, is being dismantled. But guys of my generation, that's what we grew up with. And we're all having to untie that. And so, for instance, for me, I had to learn how to dance. And not like methodically, like, like go and learn the cha-cha or the two-step. How to free form, listen to music, and let it flow through my body and let myself move. Right? I had to learn how to do that without feeling like wrong about mm -hmm. it. And so for me, that was actually a big part of my journey of stepping into the lover was just going to music festivals and going to like ecstatic dance and where it's like, there's no talking and shoes off. And it's just like, go feel the music and just embody it and let it come through you. Like that's, that's a true lover experience. If you want to, guys, if you want to get stretched, go to an ecstatic dance in your own city and don't talk to anybody and just take your shoes off and practice dancing and letting the music flow through you. That's, that's a, that's a good stretch for a lot of guys, but I'd love to hear your uh, suggestions. Well, I love that because, um, I help throw an ecstatic dance here in Portland. I am an ecstatic dance DJ. My life has been so connected to it. And I completely agree. Like right to, to let the body move through its emotion is, is so powerful. Uh -huh. Um, one thing that came to mind is also, I have found myself pushing away my lover. And what I mean by that is that idea of the addict, the addict being the part of us that craves, that wants. I saw that as terrible, as bad. I don't want that. So I really suppressed my desires, suppressed my cravings, thinking they were you know, mundane and profane and all these things, not spiritual and enlightened. And it's taken me a long time to unravel that and realize, you know what? My desires are great. My mm. craving connection, my craving delicious things, good moments, beauty is a, is a great thing that I should fully give into. Not so much that I'm into the negative patterns of it, but recognizing that that, that shadow I could actually use more in my life to balance out mm -hmm. too much of this lost dream or too much of being disconnected and instead embracing my desires to, mm -hmm. to become more, uh, potent and connected to my lover. Yeah. Learning, leaning into feeling. And I mean, we probably could do a good half hour on talking about this just related yeah. to sex with men. Like uh -huh. uh, how do you, how do you really bring the mature lover into sex and just like really like feeling, um, just embracing, like feeling good and connected to your body rather than sort of the addict, which is like, ah, I want to get off, you know, like, let's get to the end. And then, and then I'm going to do someone else. And then I'm going to pick up this gal and I'm going to go do her, you know, like that's sort of the addict side, but this, this, 
the mature version of the lover in sex is like really connected to his body and to his breath and to his lover that he's with. And, Hmm. and it's not, it's not 10 seconds long. There's this like drawn out, like in the moment, uh, you know, uh, longevity to it because he's actually truly feeling he's not like shooting for a goal. Right. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's so much here and men really would benefit from spending time here. Um, but, uh, let's move on to the father or the sovereign. I think the father will be great because uh, with these elements, right? The element of this one is earth mm-hmm. and it's all around caregiving, creating a safe space and providing for others. When we're looking at the father, it's not so much about if you have a child, it's about how do you create a community, uh, a connection around you that really helps feed other people, that feeds your community, right? So it's also about responsibility. What is one's responsibility towards the people they love? How do you fulfill those responsibilities? Do you show up? Do you run away from them? And another big piece of this is around the earth, around nature. How do we care for our land? Because how we care for our land is how we care for our lovers. Mm -hmm. How we care for the earth is really how we sustain ourselves and the future. Mm -hmm. So there's, yeah, there's a real sort of stewardship energy here. Uh, There's a, it's, it's really about service, Mm -hmm. service to others, you know, and, and I think this is really important, you know. Um, it's, I've heard it said many times that the mark of a, of a a mature man or an initiated man is that he is in service. He's in service to his community. And I think for a lot of guys, this happens once they have a family, Hmm. but sometimes it's also more consciously chosen where it's like, I'm going to create this thing that's going to serve these people. Uh, but yeah, if you, if you think about like a, a noble man in the village, he's doing something for the collective. He's holding something for everybody, whether it's the food or whether it's, you know, the, the town walls or whether it's the infrastructure, he's, he's like caring for the people. And of course, family, you know, caring the, the parent who's there to sort of like pick you up and support you. Um, And so the shadow of this is like, you know, skirting one's responsibilities, right? There's like the deadbeat, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I was just about to say that this is what makes my system different than King, Warrior, Magician, Lover, is I created this fifth one, which is the father. Reason I did that was twofold. One, because then I have the five elements, which is great. Uh, But the second reason was the father was kind of put in with the the king archetype in the king warrior magician lover and that just didn't really fit well with me because Mm -hmm. it connected this kind of larger than life um kind of overseer strategy divinity to procreation and children and caregiving and i just i felt like separating it gave it its own space i really love that you did that Mm -hmm. yeah And to also recognize that caregiving can be masculine, like giving that a voice Mm -hmm. as compared to always saying that that's a feminine attribute Mm -hmm. is like, no, masculine, masculine fatherhood has its own unique caregiving and feel as well. Yes. 100%. Yeah. The King is such a big a subject, a big archetype to, to talk about that. I I love that you did that because it's like, now we have this other guy who's like on the throne who's in charge of the kingdom. And then we have this, and he's like almost like higher up, you know, the throne is like pointing up to the heavens. Mm -hmm. And then we have this other man who's got a lot of responsibility as well, but he's connected to the earth. He's connected to his family. He's connected to his village, to his land, the dirt, the, (laughs) the, the grass, the goats, like stewardship, right? Like really Mm -hmm. sort of taking care of this realm down here. He's the caretaker here. And, um, there's, there is so much there. So I, I love that you did that. Hmm. Um, and so, yes, so the shadow of the, of the, the father is the deadbeat, the deadbeat dad. So if there's a part of you that doesn't want to stand up for your responsibilities, right? Or if there ever was that part of you that was just like, I want other people to do it for me, right? <laughs> that's the part of you that's like the deadbeat, you know? I don't want to have to work or, or like hold this 
for you or for anyone else, right? Yeah. And a lot of times the deadbeat is, it comes out of a fear of, oh, I can't take on that responsibility because I'm not good enough. Like I can't care for that kid because I never learned how to love or how to be a good father. So how could I be a father? Right. So it's kind of putting away your responsibility out of fear. Yeah. And then the other side is the constant rescuer, which is the helicopter parent, the person who comes in and saves. Yeah. Just like constantly protecting everyone from everything. And that can be very stifling to someone's empowerment and someone's growth because tension is good. Tension is what creates strength. It's what creates resilience. Um, and that is also coming from fear. Usually the parent or the caregiver not wanting to lose who they're caring for and, and starting to wrap their own identity around the person that they're protecting. Uh -huh. So you have to have this kind of open hand between those two things. How mm -hmm. can I allow those I care enough space to hurt themselves, but then be there to help them through that? Mm -hmm. Right. That's how you really create an empowered growth for someone. Uh huh. Yeah. And I think we are in a time where there's a lot of nice guys and they're the constant rescuer is sort of wrapped up in that. Like, oh, I got to take care of your feelings. Right. There's this subtle story operating inside nice guys that says, I got to take care of your feelings. And so I think it's good just to acknowledge here that like, there's a more mature version of that, you know, uh, where you're, you're, you're able to be there for someone, you're able to hold space, but you're also not going to just take everything on and you're not just going to try to rescue the person all the time. Right. Mm -hmm. Again, that's a whole other podcast. Um, but there, there is a way, right. So, um, to step into the father, it's really like, taking responsibility for the things that are in front of you, uh, being of service to your community. How can I help, you know, charity work? How can I go give back to people that need what I have to give? Everybody has something to give. And so how can you be of service to your community? Man, we need the father now more than ever, right? We, it's, yeah. we were in a commodified society that's very individualistic and everybody just wants to like do what's good for them. Right. So, <laughs> Man, we need we need people who literally have like a altruistic desire to to help and to make the world a better place. Yeah. Um, anything else to step into the father? If guys want to practically like take a step, I think a big part of it is empowerment, and it's just asking yourself in a situation, like, is me doing this for someone else empowering them or taking it away? So a good example of that is with this one friend, I was kind of, we were in a band together and I took care of everything. I took care of the bookings. I took care of like the music, uh, all the stuff around it. And in a way I did that to keep them close to me because I felt, well, if I take care of everything, then they're not going to leave me as a musical partner. And over time that totally poisoned our relationship and it ended really badly. Whereas in if I ask myself, oh, me taking on this responsibility, does it empower them? Does it give them space? And if it does, do it. And if it doesn't, you don't have to take that on because it's actually going to hurt mm -hmm. those that you have. So just ask yourself on the daily, like in your relationships, in your work um, with people you love, is this empowering someone? How could it empower them more? Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Yeah, that's a really good leadership question to ask yourself mm -hmm. every day. Okay, I just want to be mindful of time. Do we uh, do we got to go, or do we can do the sovereign? Yeah, we had we have fifteen more minutes. So okay, let's do it. We're gonna do the sovereign. So yeah, the sovereign is this other sort of kingly piece uh, connected to this sort of. Uh, I'm just gonna let you describe it, and I would love to hear the element. Is it like mountain or space? Like, <laughs> tell well, me. It, well, it's spirit. Uh huh. Yeah. Spirit, yeah. other, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Got it. So the king or the sovereign is all around the safety of the realm. It's around how do you create a harmonious and beautiful place in which you live, your children live, the society lives. And it's also around strategy, diplomacy, 
interacting with others in a good way, just creating that sense of harmony and rightfulness around you, Mm -hmm. right? And in some ways, it's also connected to the larger than life aspect of why we're even here. Like, what is this all about? It's to create this beautiful heaven on earth. It's to create a connection with divinity for myself and other. And how can I do that? What what skills do I need? What actions do I need to take? Mm -hmm. Right? All of that creates such a beautiful space for yourself and others. And a big key around the sovereign is it's not about you being in control of other people. It's about you being truly sovereign, knowing your own energy, being one with it, knowing your impact, but then growing your impact in a positive way. How can I use my skills to protect the sovereignty of others, but also work together to make something bigger and more beautiful? Uh-huh. Right. And that's how we make towns. That's how we make cities. That's how we make nations. That's how we make um, family. All of it is just the extending out of ourselves beyond ourselves into the group mind together. Uh huh. Yeah. I love that you said towns because, like, every town has a mayor. Uh-huh. Right. He, perfect or imperfect as he is, he was elected to, to hold the king seat in that town. And, he, and he's the guy that says, like, yeah, we're going to focus on this over here. We're not going to focus on this over here, you know, and maybe there's mm-hmm. votes or whatever. And there's people trying to get his ear and, and, uh, you know, affect decision-making, but he's the guy who's like at the top occupying that seat for better or for worse. And as stressful as it can be, he's like, I will do this. And he's doing it for them. And he's doing it because he knows at some level that someone's got to take that seat and he's, yeah. he's owning it, you know? Um, I think this is probably the hardest one for people to understand that the, the, the the sovereign or the king. Um, it's not as uh, distinct and understandable as the others for whatever reason. Um, because perhaps because it's almost more spiritual in nature, right? You know, mm-hmm. I recently watched the Lion King again, just to like <laughs> s- watch for all the archetypes and see like, oh, Timon and Pumbaa are like this, you know, uh, the love the representative of lover. Yeah. And, uh, it, it's, it's actually really great to watch again, but you know, there's some really cool stuff at the beginning and at the end where um, Simba is taught about the laws of the kingdom and the laws of the world. And like uh, what happens when you really claim and say like, this is my kingdom and these are the rules in the kingdom and I will be the ruler of this kingdom. Like I will, I will, I will step into this seat, not because I love power and control, but because someone needs to lead, right? Mm-hmm. Um, another way of describing this archetype is, um, my friend Jeevan describes it this way. He basically he says like, when he describes it with four archetypes, uh, he says, it's, it's like you're standing in the middle with the video game controller and to your <laughs> left is the lover, to your right is the warrior and to, in front of you is the magician. And you, uh, as, as the guy with the controller, as the king, are sort of choosing which one of those archetypes to deploy at any given time. And you're being strategic with it. And you're like, ah, lover, I need you right now. Ah, warrior, I need you right now. And, and just that archetype of sort of choosing and making the strategic decision and um, you know trying to move the game forward uh, in a noble way, in a good way, that's kingly, right? That's, mm-hmm. That kind of is the king archetype. Um, and what happens to men when they're really embodying the King in their lives is there's this like flourishing, there's a flowering and an abundance that comes to them. And it might not be financial, uh, but it, it, it might be in terms of how fulfillment, how they feel about their lives or people really like learning, trusting them, uh, and, and being revered in their community. It also might be financial, you know, there, there might be all kinds of abundance that happens for a man when he uh, is embodying this archetype. Now, what are the shadows? There's, uh, yeah, what, what's your description of the shadows of, of the, the sovereign? Yeah, so in my version, we have the oppressor, which is the overactive, and that is taking charge and taking over things and not allowing room for anyone else's opinion, not allowing them to kind of take any shape in the decision-making process, right? Right. And again, this comes from... 
Saddam Hussein of archetypes. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> and again, this, this comes from fear usually, which is if you give up some of that power, then you're powerless. But someone who's really aligned with the sovereign and king archetypes realize that power is not something you lose by giving it to someone else, that we actually empower each other, we grow and we all move up. Mm -hmm. So it's taking it away from other people and trying to you know, protect it by filling yourself. But in reality, you're just hurting everyone else around you and you're losing the balance to your own power as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, it's the strong man. Um, it's, uh, like I said, this is Saddam Hussein or it's Scar in the Lion King. Scar uh -huh. is the, uh, what's also known as the tyrant, the tyrant king. He wants power for power's sake. He wants it for himself. And there's this sort of darkness in that, that we're not always going to see, by the way, folks, like your darkness isn't always going to feel dark to you. It might just feel really justified. It might feel really good. You know, I was talking with my men's group last night about how when something happens to uh, a particularly a woman that we care about, that we just want to go on a tear and chop some heads off and how that actually feels kind of good. Like, mm -hmm. I want to wreck somebody, right? Because that protective side of you comes up and you're like, oh, bloodlust, right? <laughs> so these shadows, they actually feel kind of good. The addict kind of feels good, <laughs> you know, going mm -hmm. on a bender, right? And the tyrant is the same. Like it, it, it feels good to just like take power and, and wield it however the fuck you want, right? So, uh, but there is this sort of, what's behind all that is this sort of darkness controlling a person. That's mm -hmm. our shadow. And it's coming from an insecure place, right? So, um, yeah, that's, that's the tyrant. And I think we've all had a tyrant in our lives. We've all had bosses that were kind of tyrannical. Some of us have lived in countries that are tyrannical, uh, <laughs> right? <laughs> And, or we've seen tyrannical uh, laws passed, whatever. Um, what's, the, what's the other shadow? Yeah, so the underactive is the entitled prince. Another way of viewing this is the high chair tyrant, mm -hmm. right? The, the kid that's just whining that wants everything taken care of. So the idea of the entitled prince is they just believe that everything should be done for them. It's not like they're pushing other people to do it like the tyrant. The tyrant is going to manipulate and control and cause all this havoc by forcing people to do something. The entitled prince just believes it should all be handed to them on a silver platter, right? They're just causing a wreck around them because they have no connection to their responsibilities at all. They have no idea how hard other people are working to make things work and they're just totally taking advantage of things. Mm -hmm. uh, so in that way, it's not really stepping up to one's king or sovereign energy. It's not being fully aligned with understanding your impact and working together with people to find the best outcome. It's just like, eh, mm -hmm. someone else will do that because I deserve it. Uh -huh. The skirting of responsibility also known. It, 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 another way of seeing this is kind of like the weakling. Right, like, mm -hmm. nah, I can't, I, I can't handle it. This is too much for me, so I want someone else to do it. Yeah, right. yeah, and that can also look like giving away your sovereign energy, mm -hmm. right? So one thing they talk about in King Warrior Magician Lover is this idea that one of the reasons we've had so much problems with the king is because people have not understood their own internal power and they give it away to someone else. Mm. Like, oh, I don't need to be politically active. I'm going to give all that energy to you, and you do whatever you want with it. Yeah. And then they're mad that the person did something they didn't want them to do because <laughs> they've given it away and then don't like the outcome. So that's yeah. another piece of when we don't step into this. Uh -huh. So, uh, you know, how can guys nurture the their relationship to the sovereign? Is it really just about... Um, looking around at where they're not stepping up in their lives and, um, you know, claiming, um, claiming what's really theirs and, um, maybe stepping into power or responsibility in a good way when it's been offered to them or when they've had an opportunity to lead and not taking that opportunity. You know, I had a number of times in my, in my late twenties where people were like, Hey, you're a leader in this way, or you should lead this. And, and my internal story was like, 
no, I don't, I, I can't, I, I'm, I'm not ready or I'm, I'm, I'm not good enough. And, and so I would not accept that power and I would not take that seat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So some other great practical things is around the sovereign is also our strategy of how we choose to get things done, how we be effect effective in our life, right? Like the warrior's out doing, the lover's out like just enjoying a good drink. Uh, you know, all the other ones are, are kind of busy in their own worlds where like you were saying with the controller, the game controller, the sovereign's really choosing what comes in and out. So to practice that, some real simple things are strategy games. They're awesome, do them with some <laughs> friends. You'll understand like, oh, if I invest now, then it'll 10 turns down the line. It'll turn into this whole thing. Uh -huh. And that'll teach you a lot around investing your energy, you know, delayed gratification. Um, also just being really good with to-do lists and understanding what is important and what's not important in the moment. All those things will help you be more effective as a person, as a leader, mm -hmm. as someone embodying their masculinity. Uh -huh, beautiful. Yeah. In a way I was just picturing people doing Brendan Burchard's, uh, course or his book. Like I haven't done it, but I've seen so many different versions of this where like you're sitting down, you're, you're like, what are my top three priorities today? What's my larger goal? What's my one-year goal? My five-year goal? How is what I'm doing today connected to my five-year goal? And then like, here's my calendar on my wall. Like here's all the stuff that's coming up that's happening. And just having that big map of, of like, what's important to you, what's your mission and how are you taking steps towards, um, doing that? It's also feels very aligned with, with, with this energy of the sovereign. Mm -hmm. And if, if I were to add one other piece, it'd be more the spiritual aspect, which is just harder for us to explain. It's ephemeral, but what I keep thinking about is meditation. Mm -hmm. There's that moment. I know meditation can be really hard, especially you're new to it, but if you stick with it for a bit, there's a moment in which it feels like your consciousness moves above you. It's, it's watching you. It's watching your life unfurl with this kind of openness. That is the truest throne of the king and sovereign. So learning to get into that, that, that mind that's above mind, mm -hmm. like the higher self, to sit mm -hmm. and move from there, there you go. That's the king. Booyah. Beautiful, man. Okay, we put a cap on it. That was amazing. Um, Isaac, where can people find you? Uh, you know, where should they look if, if they want to um, see any other talks that you've given or uh, buy a deck of cards? Yeah, thank you. So at herorise.us, that's my website. You got my deck. You've got a free ebook. And I also write tons of articles, about two or three articles a week around archetypes masculinity and many other things. So um, check that out. Instagram as well. Uh, just look up hero rise.us and feel free to connect with me. I I'm passionate about this, talk about it every day. Uh, so, so grateful to be here on this show for the work that you do as well. Just, it's amazing seeing how this is impacting the world and just all the people you inspire. So grateful to be a part of it. Thank you, Isaac. And thank you for being a trooper. We, we jumped into this with like no plan whatsoever. Like, let's just <laughs> dig in. Let's talk about this. And, and I think yeah. it went really well, man. So uh, thank you for taking the time and for sharing this. I, so many guys in my brotherhood are going to eat this up. So really appreciate you, my man. Love that. Thanks, Ben. All right. All the best.